I just want to welcome everybody to the Conservative Book of the Year Award Dinner and ISI's inaugural homecoming weekend. We are absolutely thrilled to see all of you here this June. We did not anticipate this many and are just delighted with the results. We're so glad that you're here uh, this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> So for those who don't know me, my name is Clara Gouda, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at ISI. Um, we are so glad to be able to welcome alumni, faculty, students, and friends of ISI here this weekend. Uh, be prepared for a fantastic weekend of conversation and fellowship and great discussion of ideas, of course, because it's ISI. Uh, I, at this moment, I'd like to introduce our president, uh, Johnny Burka. Johnny is a graduate of Hillsdale College and earned a graduate degree in theology from La Faculté Jean Calvin in France. He previously served as the uh, director, executive director of the American Conservative before returning to ISI this past year. We were very excited to welcome him back. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Great. Thank you so much, Claire, and welcome to Wilmington, Delaware. And thanks, our found, thanks to our founders for putting it in ISI's charter that we're uh, never allowed to be located in DC or New York. So we're happy to welcome you to the Brandywine every spring. <clears throat> well, this event marks a new tradition for us at ISI, uh, which was really sparked by many conversations that I had when I came on as president in September speaking with professors, speaking with alumni, students, and staff, and the one common theme that, kept, that came up over and over again is that each of them, in their own unique way, saw ISI as their alma mater. It was the place where they were introduced to the professors who introduced them to the great books that would change the course of their life. It was the place where they built and made friendships that would last, in some cases, for six or seven generations, uh, going back to uh, one of our longest standing board members, Dick Allen, uh, graduated from ISI in 1957 and uh, was still on the board through today when he became uh, an emeritus member of uh, ISI's board. So uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to welcome all of you here, uh, to see the generations of ISI all gathered in one place. Uh, so that we can celebrate our history, but also dream about the future that we will build together uh, for ISI as an institution and for the country. Uh, in that spirit, and since we're among friends, I thought it'd be the perfect uh, venue to unveil two things. The first is ISI's new logo, uh, which you can direct your attention to the monitors. Uh, so this past year, we've thought long and hard about the image for ISI that we wanted to present to the world. We wanted something that was collegiate, sincere and principled. Uh, you'll see the monogram, the two eyes forming a pillar, which is a nod to ISI's first uh, logo. Uh, you'll see a couple people here. I think Eric Wind has a vintage pillar ISI tie. Uh, the column represents fortitude and constancy. Uh, the S is depicted as a, a climbing vine representing friendship and wisdom, and the star beneath it uh, the North Star, the Star of David, guiding us on towards the search for truth. So if you like the logo, feel free to pick up a tie or some L.L. Bean swag with the logo uh, on your way out the door tonight. Uh, I'm also happy to share that uh, thanks to one of our board members, John Slavic, we are also rolling out a new ISI app, uh, which you can see on your screen. This is really going to be the, the hub, the central resource for all the information you can find about this weekend. So if you go in the App Store, Google the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, if you open it up and click on the community section, uh, you can uh, find a way where you can actually pose questions. So the first question after every speech, including tonight and after the panels tomorrow, will actually take through the app. So I would encourage you to download the app uh, if you want to ask a question. So ISI has a long history here at the Hotel DuPont. Uh, it used to be the site for our annual dinner for Western civilization, and we've welcomed some of ISI's most prestigious speakers uh, right here in this room, right where I'm standing, from uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas to Justice Sam Alito to the late Antonin Scalia and many more. And we are honored uh, tonight to add a Yuval Levin to that prestigious list of speakers, uh, as well as uh, our youngest and most successful alumni who are part of ISI's top 20 alumni under 30. 
before we get started, I'd also like to thank uh, Bill McClay. Professor McClay uh, is with us this evening, and he actually won the Conservative Book of the Year Award last year, but he uh, has to live in envy of you all because he did not get a fancy dinner due to the pandemic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but you uh, all get to hear from him tomorrow morning uh, on the panel about academia. Uh, I'd also like to thank our gold, platinum, and chairman's circle sponsors. Uh, these financial supporters made this evening possible. Uh, the late Henry and Ann Paolucci for endowing the book prize, uh, Linda Bean's Perfect Maine, Thomas Lynch, Bill and Helen Campbell, Dick Allen, Chris Long, Ken Cribb, John Slavic, Jim Pearson, John Lehman, Judy Yeager, and Ed Fulner. Thank you so much. So before we move on to our alumni awards, I just want to say a brief word about ISI's educational mission on campuses today uh, in America. So you don't need me to tell you this. All you have to do is scroll through Twitter or turn on the evening news to see that our country is seriously unwell. We are facing multiple crises at the same time, political, cultural, economic, moral, educational, familial. And conservatives are, are by and large right to blame liberalism or its hard variant, woke progressivism, for either creating or exacerbating many of these, many of these woes. But if we are truly committed to restoring, reviving, and rebuilding this great nation, as you all will talk about later tonight, we must dig a little bit deeper and understand the root causes uh, for why these utopian ideologies are so popular with young people today. Uh, and this really, the, the, the veil was sort of lifted for me uh, several weeks ago uh, when I attended a dear friend's graduation uh, ceremony at a reputable liberal arts uh, college here on the East Coast, which will go uh, unnamed. And uh, I attended the graduation. And I was sort of bracing myself for uh, a lot of woke platitudes about identity politics, you know, for a lecture, um, you know, uh, a lot of virtue signaling. And to my great surprise, uh, there was absolutely none of that whatsoever. Uh, it was probably um, the most bland uh, graduation ceremony I've ever heard. It was really mediocre. Um, most, of, most of the ceremony, uh, from the keynote speaker to the chairman of the board, was encouraging the students to pat themselves on the back for the hard year that they had watching Zoom classes. Uh, there was a lot of talk and platitudes about self-actualization and pursuing your dreams and just, you know, all of it would happen uh, presumably within three months of them graduating. They'd arrive to sort of the pinnacle of human happiness created entirely by themselves. And I just thought, oh my goodness, this is so empty, it's so materialistic in a word. It, it was low. It was low in its aims. Uh, in fact, I'm confident that if I just looked out and randomly pointed into this audience, that anyone could give a better speech on the spot without any preparation. And so I left this thinking to myself, well, gosh, no wonder uh, that so many students are demanding that their $100,000 in student debt be forgiven, especially when they can't find a job, right? Our system of higher education, with a few notable exceptions and pockets, is nothing but a giant grift that only benefits bureaucrats and bankers. Reminds me of, uh, Tocqueville was prophetic when he said, the American public will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public with the public's money. And I think that's an apt description for what's going on in our university system. And I think the real reason that so many young people, the root cause that they're embracing uh, the cause of becoming a social justice warrior is they see through the emptiness, but they don't exactly know where to turn. Right? And they're not wrong to want to situate themselves in a great story, to long to fight for justice, to champion liberty as they understand it. Uh, but they're misguided, right? And life on campus, the intellectual life is so dry, it's so arid, um, that the smallest spark can start a wildfire. And I think that's what we saw this past year with the explosion of, of cancel culture that emanated from college campuses, statue toppling, and sort of the attempts to remove any of the great books from the curriculum. And this is truly why ISI's mission is so vital today, right? In order to fill the void in the higher education system, ISI must become America's university. And what I mean by that is not that we need to offer four-year degrees, but it's simply that, historically speaking, there was a time when ISI was really a supplement to a student's education. It was sort of a finishing school. 
Whereas today, ISI is truly the main course, right? It's the entree. They're getting McDonald's every day. We're offering them Thanksgiving dinner. And if we're going to be successful in winning uh, the battle, the fight for the cause of liberty, negation is not going to be enough, right? It's easy and a little bit lazy to make fun of all the wackiness that we see on college campuses. If you go to Princeton, you don't even need to study classical languages anymore to get a major in the classics. Uh, it's easy and it's funny, but it's also a bit lazy. Uh, and so if conservatives want to win, we have to tell a better story. And ISI is positioned better than any other conservative youth organization with our network of almost 4,000 professors and 50,000 alumni to invite, to invite students on a lifelong journey to pursue liberty, to pursue virtue, and to pursue truth. To invite them to step through C.S. Lewis's prover proverbial wardrobe into a great conversation that has been going on for centuries. It goes all the way back to Jerusalem, to Lund to Jerusalem, to Athens, to Rome, to London, and culminating in Philadelphia just up the road where our nation's experiment in liberty was born. This is a priceless treasure, and we have a sincere duty and obligation to carry it out. Our founding fathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And this year at ISI, we have done our very small part to honor that legacy. Our fearless programs team and development team has been on the road since September uh, crisscrossing the country, conducting over 150 lectures, debates, and seminars for college students and for alumni. Uh, during this period of time, the last nine months, they've actually grown uh, the number of campus newspapers, societies, student members, faculty members, and donations all by over 20% across the board. So in a year that's been filled with so much anxiety and so much uncertainty, I couldn't be more proud of the courage and the grace and the poise that our team at ISI has shown. And none of this would have been possible without you people in the room, without your generous financial support, without your encouragement, your mentorship, your friendship, and the example that you set for them as ISI alumni. So uh, as president, I thank you sincerely for that, and I'm happy to welcome you to uh, Homecoming Weekend. I'd now like to welcome uh, ISI's chairman of the board, uh, Thomas Lynch, uh, who is actually an ISI Weaver Fellow alumni uh, who studied at the University of Oxford and the uh, founder of Mill Road Capital to say a few brief words before we do alumni awards about the impact that ISI can have on a young person's life. Well, thank you, everyone. When, when Johnny and I began thinking of this event, um, we thought of maybe we'd need a room for maybe 30 or 40 people. And it's just delightful to see so many of you here today and uh, to see people who, uh, whose lives have been touched by ISI. Now, truth be told, um, you were supposed to be hearing Ken Cribb, not me, speak tonight. Um, Ken is indisposed. I believe he's flying somewhere over Philadelphia right now, and, and my guess is, um, when that plane lands, there'll be very few empty little bottles of Jack Daniels on that plane. Um, Johnny walked up to me, I'd say, oh, 20 minutes ago, and he said, uh, Ken can't make it. It's either you or nobody. And I looked in Johnny's eyes, and I saw it was a tough choice. So, 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 so uh, Johnny, thank you, for the, thank you for that vote of confidence. I appreciate it. Um, you know, lately I've been reading um, Leo Strauss, and actually all of Leo Strauss's or many of his lectures are online, and he, he, um, he, he uh, did a famous lecture about 60 years ago called Political Philosophy. And the first line of that lecture goes like this. He says, all political action is about preservation or change. All political action is about preservation or change. And as conservatives, what we have is we have a predisposition towards preservation. We have that predisposition because somewhere deep inside all of us there's a, 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 a sense of humility that we have. We have a humility about what any single human being can understand. We have a humility about what human rationality can achieve. We have, 
you know, what Roger Scruton said was an appreciation of the fact that the great things in civilization are more easily destroyed than they are created. And we have an appreciation for all of the generations that preceded us, that contributed to everything we, we have today in terms of Western civilization, and all of the riches and abundance and freedoms we have in this country today. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing to have you all here together because you represent the generations of ISI. And if we looked at the very early generations of ISI, you know, who do we see? Johnny mentioned Richard Allen, who joined ISI in one form in 1955. Richard Allen had an odd idea in the 1970s that if you were on any campus in the United States, it was counter-revolutionary. He had the idea that the Cold War could be won. And there was a side that was right, and there was a side that was wrong. Where did Dick Allen begin? Dick Allen began at ISI. I'm looking at my colleague there, Ed Fulner, who I have just tremendous respect for, who was a, one of the earliest Weaver Fellows. And Ed had this idea that there could be something called the Heritage Foundation, and that Heritage Foundation could present binders and binders of information so that Ronald Reagan can be an effective president. Larry Arn, who's not here tonight, had the idea, a preposterous idea, that something could exist that was a conservative university. And he built that, and he's turned it not into a conservative university, but into a great university. And that is just an absolutely remarkable achievement. So, Tonight we celebrate all of the generations at ISI that came before us. I come to ISI with tremendous gratitude. I was a campus representative. ISI was good enough through a Weaver Fellowship to send me to Oxford. ISI was good enough to publish me in modern age. And it is just the privilege of a lifetime for me to be involved in this board of directors. And what we're going to introduce to you tonight is the next generation of Larry Arns and Ed Fulners um, and, uh, and Dick Allens. We have a group of what we call our 20 under 30. And these are the generation that are gonna give you a glimmer of hope for the future. These are the generation that are going to give you, and I, I encourage you to meet them tonight. They're just an extraordinary group of people. Please meet them because when you meet them and when you talk to them, no matter how disconsolate you are or where our movement is right now, you'll have faith in the future. So it's my privilege to be in front of you tonight. Thank you for coming. And it is more than a privilege to be able to introduce the latest generation of ISI students. Thank you. Our top 20 under 30 leaders, please come to the stage to my left here as we get going. <laughs> All right, our first award winner is Kelsey Bloom. Andrew Guernsey. James Holt. Wells King. Francis Lee. Will Long. Gracie Olmstead.
Brad Richardson. Margaret Roberts Cole. Brother Charles Marie Rooney. Xavier Serrani. And Garrett Ziegler. So you might be counting and wondering if that adds up to 20. It does not. We will be having some of our award winners joining us via Zoom. They're available. Here we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'd like to read off their names. We have Michael Bradley, Alexandra DeSanctis, Dominic DiGiovanni, Cassie Dillon, Oliver Ha, Carl Reimer, Micah Metacroft, and Parker Steele. Congratulations to all the top 20 under 30 award winners. Uh, similar to uh, Ken Cribb, our original speaker for tonight, her plane was delayed in California and would be arriving at midnight, so she is not here for this dinner. So at the very last minute, I asked the eloquent Maggie Roberts to come up and give us a speech. Maggie, uh, when she was a student at Seattle University, was an honor scholar, society leader, and DeVos award winner. She is starting at, in the fall at University of Texas in law school. So Maggie, come on up. Good evening, all. I'm sorry Cassie couldn't be here with us in person, and I don't wish anyone the experience of waiting on a tarmac for their flight to take off, so I uh, hope she'll be able to join us early tomorrow morning. This evening, um, meeting all of these welcoming faces, seeing some familiar, some not, and feeling a sense of coming home, I've been reminded of my first ISI conference. As a freshman, I went to an extremely progressive school in one of the most progressive cities in America. My first ISI conference was really the homecoming I was yearning for and didn't really know that I needed. And since then, becoming involved in ISI, as, as Claire mentioned, it's truly changed my life. First, it helped me convince my parents that it really is possible to get a job with a philosophy degree, which I appreciated. And uh, it has inspired me to question the principles that I live my life by, day by day. And perhaps most importantly, I actually met my husband at an ISI conference. So, thank you, ISI. <laughs> what has changed my life the most about ISI is truly the people that I've gotten to know over the years and continue to build relationships with to this day. In my experience, most collegiate programs offered on college campuses usually promise undergraduates some sort of deliverable or outcome that they think may be of utility for them, whether this be social connections, expertise, or some kind of social clout, networking. Uh, usually there's some sort of promise attached. Contrastingly, ISI promotes things like intellectual curiosity, digging deeper into why you believe what you believe, the inculcation of virtue, and community engagement. These are things that I think undergraduates are rarely asked to do in the modern day academy, and yet they are vital to becoming principled public leaders that our country so vitally needs today. To me, it is indisputable that this focus on virtue and excellence produces the very best leaders that we have to offer from this country, as is evidenced by those who were just recognized on this stage and every alumni that is in this room that is making a difference in their community and our country at large. We are revitalizing every sector, including technology, media, military, the arts, politics, and within our homes, and changing the culture from within our homes. I truly believe that these are the leaders that will ultimately reverse the tide of our tumultuous culture. And I would like to thank all of the alumna that I know, and I hope to know soon, for encouraging me to pursue the good life for the past six years. Most of all, I'd like to thank the ISI donors and leadership, without whom tonight and the past six years of my life and many other years for alumna who have been more involved with ISI than I, 
None of this would be, none of this would have been possible. Thank you for forging the path for us for so many years, and thank you for believing in us. And on behalf of all of the 20 under 30 uh, award recipients, thank you for this honor, and I look forward to getting to know you more this weekend. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Maggie. And uh, now it's time for dinner. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, uh, Father Christopher uh, Ede up to uh, give the blessing. Father Christopher is the pastor at Holy Ascension Antiochian Orthodox Church in Westchester, Pennsylvania. So welcome. What you're going to say was just New York. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for the invite, uh, Johnny. I know we're all hungry, but... Uh, all this uh, conservatism and all this ISI and Johnny being one of my parishioners and his invitation came by a phone call. So, but it was so special. He called me in a very bad timing. I had counseling, so I answered and said, I'll call you back. When I called him back, he immediately said, you are invited to say the open prayer at ISI. I said, fine, I'll be there, but what should I wear? Should I wear a suit? He said, no, Father, be original. <laughs> so I like that very much. Even the president of ISI speaks about originalism because listening about this fast food meal and this main course and seeing all these beautiful faces with a lot of education, I think we need to think about life, a little bit more about life. You are the heart. You, educators, supporters, and students, you are the heart of the future. Let's think about life. Continue this life, pumping the blood to keep this kind of education alive for our future generations. I appreciate the invite, and I hope I'm original now. <laughs> God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O heavenly God, the God of our fathers, the author of all creation, wisdom, and knowledge, the fountain of life, love, care, and all giving, the king of all principalities in heaven and on earth, we beseech your blessings from on high to all leaders, board of trustees, supporters, donors, employees, members, and students of ISI for their life, their health, their education, and for the things that we need but we know not to ask. Bless us, Father. Bless our, our weekend together. Bless our nation and unite us under thy name and bless our food and drink that we are about to partake for your name is always glorified and blessed unto ages of ages. Amen. God bless you all and thank you for having me. Good evening. My name is Johnny Burtka and I'm the president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to our annual Conservative Book of the Year Award. Uh, and this year's winner is Yuval Levin. Yuval is the author of the book, Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. I met Yuval uh, about five years ago. I had been a longtime fan of his work. It was actually an ISI Weaver Fellow who introduced me to him by email. Uh, and I was a young fan of Yuval. So I had listened to his podcasts. I had read his books. I showed up at his office very eager with a notepad of like 30 questions and uh, tried to make my way through these questions in about 45 minutes. So I peppered him with questions about, uh, about Edmund Burke, about Thomas Paine, about uh, rebuilding associations of civil society. And uh, I think he thought it was amusing and endearing because I was a student sitting at his feet. Um, and uh, at the end of the conversation, he told me that I had a big job in front of me uh, which at the time I had just become the executive director of the American Conservative. And about four years later, this summer, he said the same thing to me, you have a big job ahead of you, uh, when I came to ISI. And uh, one of the things that I love about Yuval is that he really takes a lot of young conservative leaders under his wings, he mentors them, 
you know, he invites them to his office, he speaks with them, and there are just so many young people in D.C. who really got connected to each other and got connected in their careers and their jobs because of the work that Yuval does. So I personally owe a debt of gratitude to Yuval. Uh, he's been a mentor and a friend, and I truly think he's one of the most profound and deepest thinkers uh, on the right today. Uh, his book makes a refreshing case for a bottom-up vision for how to restore, revive, and rebuild America uh, by supporting and renewing our local institutions, our churches, our schools, voluntary associations, and I think that's exactly the message that we need today. Also, he's very insightful on the state of higher education, uh, and I'm sure he'll share with us uh, tonight some insights for how ISI can do a better job educating for liberty on college campuses. He joins a prestigious group of Conservative Book of the Year Award winners, including Bill McClay, Yoram Hazoni, Brad Berzer, Daniel Hannon, Philip Hamburger, Charles Taylor, Angela Cotavia, and many more. He is the Director of Social and Cultural Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He also holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy there. He is the founding and current editor of National Affairs and a senior editor of The New Atlantis and a contributing editor to National Review. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating our esteemed guest, Yuval Levin. Well, thank you very much, Johnny. I appreciate that. And I remember well the list of questions that was very daunting to look at when you walked into the room and you checked through them one by one. And I, I'm quite sure I offered no useful answers, but I was very impressed. Um, it is really a great pleasure to be here and, and just enormously humbling and to see so many friends gathered here and just to be able to appreciate ISI, what it's done for me since I was a, an undergraduate um, coming to ISI programs. Uh, and what it's done for so many people like me who have looked for, uh, who have looked for substance and have looked for community in trying to make their way uh, through an often hostile culture uh, and be connected to the ideas that are essential to us as Americans. We were just talking at dinner about how energetic ISI is now, how much great work it's doing. Um, how great the publications are. It's really, this is a, this is a, 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 a high water mark for ISI, and I'm enormously grateful for it, as I know so many people are. And of course, thank you so much for this extraordinary honor. It's really to, to uh, especially given the f other fantastic books that you might have chosen this past year, even just among the other finalists, were book by Chris Caldwell, Ross Douthat, Rod Dreher, Robert Riley, Bradley Wilson. I can tell you, uh, Bradley Watson, I'm sorry, I can tell you, having read them, that they are all better than my book, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say so. So I am grateful for whatever clerical error or temporary insanity has landed me here, uh, rather than those authors. Uh, I shouldn't say temporary insanity, because really to me, ISI, in fact, has always been the great antidote to those serial bouts of insanity uh, that have added up to the life of our culture in the last few decades. ISI has stood against temporary insanity and for permanent sanities, uh, the, 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 the kinds of permanent sanities that are required to sustain our culture, uh, rooted in a sense of the worthiness of our inheritance as Americans uh, and, and in the worthiness of the civilization that's been passed down to us, and rooted also in a sense that that gift is so valuable because it can enable us to deal with permanent human problems the ones we always face. Our culture has been a long train of insanities because it forgets that, th that those problems are durable and that we have to learn from the ways in which they've been dealt with by wise men and women over centuries and millennia and not imagine that they don't apply anymore, that we know better now, that we don't need the institutions and the rules and the convictions and the paths to truth that those prior generations uh, have paved for us. ISI reminds college students, the people who most need that reminding, that they didn't invent the human condition, that it was here before them, that they have something to learn from how people have understood it and made the most of it, that the hunger for meaning that they feel is not new either, and that there are ways of feeding that hunger that are a lot better than the kind of thin gruel that they are too often offered where they are. That act of reminding of 
reasserting and reapplying enduring truths in new times is what conservatives are for. It is often countercultural because our culture now is often a mass exercise in self harm. But being countercultural doesn't mean that it's regressive. On the contrary, our culture presses us over and over to regress back to a kind of pre civilizational barbarism now. And to resist that pressure is exactly to make real progress possible. That, I think, is a core insight of conservatism. And it's what it means to say of a book that it is a conservative book. It means that it's a book built upon an understanding of the human person that is maybe obnoxious now to a lot of our culture, but that is conducive to true culture, to, genuine, to the genuine preconditions for the flourishing of the human person. Johnny suggested that I say a few words here about the book uh, on the off chance that somebody might not have read it among you. Um, and so what I want to do very briefly is put the argument of the book in the context of that conservative insight that I just began with, that conservative purpose, and to suggest how it applies to the predicament that we now find ourselves in America. And I'll do it briefly, I promise. A conservative book is almost unavoidably a book rooted in an idea of the human person as a creature in need of formation, in need of genuine culture. A lot of conservative books either begin or end with that basic idea and can be read as, in a sense, both beginning and ending with it. On its face, the book that you're doing me the great honor of honoring here, of recognizing tonight, ends with that conservative insight. It tries to walk the reader toward it in the hope that it might reach some readers who maybe don't start out as conservatives, and provided that Amazon doesn't ban it, might meet those readers where they are and walk them rightward over time, take them by the hand and show them something of a different way than they've been shown. So that the argument begins from America's contemporary social crisis, a crisis that anyone with eyes to see can see. We live in a divided and dysfunctional time, and the trouble presents itself not in ways that can be measured by the tools of economics, but in relational terms, as a breakdown of sociality that's ultimately maybe best understood as a breakdown of institutions. So what are institutions? I think of them basically as durable social forms, they're the structures of human society, the shapes, the contours of what we do together. Some institutions are organizations. They have something like a corporate form, a university, a hospital, a school, a business. And they're technically, legally formalized. But many institutions are durable forms of a different sort. Maybe they're shaped by laws or norms or rules. But without that kind of corporate structure, the family, after all, is the first and foremost institution of every society. We can speak of the institution of marriage or of a particular tradition or profession as an institution, the law as an institution. That they're durable is certainly essential. An institution does keep its shape over time, and so it can shape the realm of life in which it operates. Flash mobs are not institutions. But most important, what's distinct about an institution is that it is a form in the deepest sense. A form is a structure, a contour. It's the shape of the whole, the organization that speaks of its purpose and function so that a social form, an institution, is not just a bunch of people. It's a bunch of people ordered together to achieve a purpose, to pursue a goal, to advance an ideal, in a way that gives each of them a relation to the others. And that means that institutions, by their nature, are formative of us. They structure our interactions, and so they structure us. They shape our habits, our expectations. They ultimately shape our characters and our souls. They help to form us. And that formative role actually has a lot to do with how institutions relate to that social crisis that we're living through. When we think about the role of institutions in American life now, we tend to start with our loss of trust in them. That's a trend we hear a lot about. It's a cliche by this point. And measures of it are very easy to find across a very wide array of institutions, from the branches of the national government to corporations to labor unions, the professions, the media, schools, universities. Americans have been losing trust in institutions for a long time now, and that, trust, that loss of trust has accelerated in this century. But what do we actually mean when we say we don't trust institutions? Part of the answer has to do with our sense of their competence, of whether they're really up to the task they claim for themselves. But the core of the answer has to do with the formative character of institutions. To say we don't trust institutions is to say that we don't think they're forming trustworthy people. Every significant institution carries out some important task in our society. 
educating children or enforcing the law or just providing some service, meeting some need. And it does that by establishing a structure and a process, a form for combining people's efforts toward that work. And in the process, the institution forms those people to carry out that task effectively and responsibly and reliably. It shapes the people in it to be trustworthy. It gives them a particular form and makes them into a particular human type. There's such a thing in the world as an accountant or a lawyer or a journalist or a member of Congress, not to mention a mother or a priest. And we tend to trust such people when they take that form seriously, when they let it shape them into something better than they were before. A lot of that formation takes the form of setting boundaries that are taken seriously. Institutions empower us by constraining us. I trust an accountant, not because he understands the carried interest rule, but because there are things that an accountant wouldn't do. And so I have some confidence in what he does do. I trust a journalist to the extent that any of us can remember a time when we trusted a journalist, because that person's work is formed by some process of verification, correction. And I lose my trust for that person when I lose my sense that that process actually is able to form and constrain and shape that individual. That kind of loss can happen in a variety of ways. A lot of them might involve just plain corruption, an institution that fails to form trustworthy people and instead acts to shield their misbehavior. When a bank cheats its customer, when a member of the clergy abuses a child, Obviously, that kind of gross abuse of power undermines public trust in institutions. It's a familiar form of corruption, but it's not new. There are plenty of examples of it in our time, but there are a lot of examples in any time, so it doesn't exactly explain our distinct loss of confidence in institutions now. Another related but different way in which an institution can lose our trust, though, is when it just fails to impose an ethic on the people in it altogether and doesn't even seem to see that kind of formation as its purpose. When the people in that institution no longer see it as a mold of their character or their behavior, but just as a platform for themselves to perform on, to raise their profiles, to be seen. When we don't think of our institutions as formative, but as performative. When political institutions are just stages for performative outrage. When a university becomes just a venue for virtue signaling. When journalism is indistinguishable from activism, they become harder to trust. They aren't really asking for our trust. They're just asking for our attention. The book lays out how that kind of thing has happened in a series of key American institutions, in Congress and the executive, in the media and the academy, in corporate America, in parts of civil society and religion too. It thinks through the role of social media in that process, looks at the role that all of that has played in the evolution of the meritocracy in our society, the character of our elites, and it ultimately thinks through some steps that we all might be able to take to push back just a little against those trends. Those kinds of steps involve an assertion of personal commitment and responsibility. They involve asking the great unasked question of our time. Given my role here, how should I behave? Not just what do I want or what do I need, but as a member of Congress or a teacher or a scientist or a pastor or a worker or a parent, what should I be doing here? In the end, the book argues that we need to ask this kind of question because we need to recognize that we require formation in order to be capable of freedom. That is, as I say, a core conservative insight. The human person is made in a divine image, but is born unready for freedom, crooked or fallen, prone to vice or sin. And so that person requires formation in order to be free. And if that person is properly formed, he's capable of extraordinary things. The opposite view is a core progressive premise now, that the human person is born free, but everywhere is enchained by oppressive institutions. And so that person requires liberation in order to be free, rather than formation. A huge amount hinges on the question of whether the purpose of our politics is to sustain formative institutions or to liberate the individual. Almost everything hinges on that question, and certainly it's at the core of what we've come to think of as the culture war in our society. It's why the core institutions of formation, the family and the church, the school, the university, are all subjects of intense controversy and dispute now. And it's why an argument about our need for formative institutions is not a formal argument, but a substantive one. It isn't about how to turn down the temperature in our culture wars. It's about which side is right and wrong. In this sense, the aim of this book is to begin from people's everyday experience of social crisis and to walk them toward an understanding of the fundamental anthropology of conservatism. But here, among friends who take that anthropology as their premise too, 
I think it's possible to also read the book in the other direction and have it shed a little light on our moment in a different way. I'm Jewish, so I like to try to read books from right to left as well as left to right. And if you read this book from the end to the beginning, from the anthropological premise of conservatism toward an understanding of our cultural crisis, it makes the case that a failure to begin with an understanding of the fallen and imperfect nature of the human person, of the need for formative social institutions, is at fault for our society's sorry state. So it argues for a restoration of our commitment to those institutions from the bottom up as a way to recover the potential for human flourishing in modern America. The trouble that our institutions are experiencing, in other words, is not just a function of some vague and generic cultural decay. It's a function, in particular, of a failure to grasp the nature of the human person and the implications of that for the life of our society. The book doesn't just bemoan the culture war, but argues that the premises and priorities of the left in the culture war are, in some important essence, at fault for what's gone wrong, and that the path to recovery depends upon a reassertion of the other side, of our side, of the conservative side. Recovery and reassertion, though, depend on our being more persuasive, more effective, more successful in shaping the next generation. I would say, by the way, it's not quite a coincidence that the argument of the book can, in a sense, be read both forward and backward. The text is framed in something like a set of concentric circles, where the first and last of its nine chapters are both about the broad contours of our cultural crisis. The second and the next to last are about the importance of personal formation. The third and seventh chapters are about politics and civil society, and the fourth and sixth are about media and social media, and the middle chapter, the fifth chapter at the heart of the book, is the heart of the case. That fifth chapter is about the university. And it is not by coincidence that the university is at the core of the argument that I would want to make. I'll close with this because obviously it lets me return to ISI's essential work. The university is at the center of the crisis that we confront in part because it's the source of a lot of our society's most terrible ideas. And this is a crisis of terrible ideas in some important way. It's at the center too because it's where our elites are formed now. And this is a kind of crisis of elite formation. But it's also at the center because of what the university can and must be, a place where we can come to understand ourselves as human beings and as citizens, as individuals and as a nation. That ideal means that the university is something to fight for, not just something to fight against. And defending some space for it to persist, some room for us to be heard and so to be persuasive and so to offer some portion of the rising generation something healthier more nourishing than what they're being fed now, that I think is what success can look like. It's important to remember that kind of humble, modest, yet ambitious idea of success. This is a moment where the shenanigans of parts of the left can easily drive us crazy, but we have to be careful not to go crazy, to keep ourselves focused on the formation of the rising generation. This has to begin with a sensitivity to the inescapable fact that solutions have to begin with us with me, with you, not just with them. However deeply we might understand the roots of the crisis that we're living through, you can't diagnose your way to a cure. So that even if the problems we face are rooted in the corruption of others, solutions to them have to begin with us, or at least with thinking about how we can help change others, which in a free society means thinking about how we can persuade others, and therefore about how we can make what we offer more appealing, more attractive to others. We don't think enough about that now. And so we fail to notice how unattractive some of what we offer has become. Being more attractive doesn't mean bending to fashion. On the contrary, countercultural confidence is actually very appealing in a moment like this. But it does mean meeting people where they are, starting with their sense of what's gone wrong, taking their hand, walking them rightward, confident that they will see why they should go if we show them. And that surely means avoiding despair in the effort to do so. Despair is terribly off-putting, especially to serious younger people. But more importantly, despair is a mistake. It is unjustified. It's a failure of hope and gratitude. Our case has to begin not with the depravity of the status quo, but with the potential for renewal that's inherent in our best traditions. Not with resentment or with complaints, but with love and promise. When we start with what, others, with what the other side does wrong, let alone what is done wrong to us, we can really only reach the already persuaded. To reach the persuadable, we have to start with what we have to offer. And we have a lot to offer. 
conservatives are appealing when we show the rising generation why their inheritance is appealing and how it offers access to the deepest stores of wisdom and justice and sanctity and happiness. Today's young Americans clearly want all of those things, but they're being told that their inheritance offers none of them, and it's up to us to show them otherwise. And we should always ask ourselves, are we doing that? ISI is doing that, and it's doing it at the center of the action, in the belly of the beast, in the university. That work could not be more important. So above all, I want to thank you for it, and thank you for this recognition, for this humbling honor, for this chance to see so many friends, and for this chance to talk with you a little bit. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Yuval. Uh, just a couple brief uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, there, I realize we actually didn't mention what our top 20 under 30 alumni are up to in their careers. So if you're interested in reading more, take a 2021 yearbook uh, on your way out the door and you can read more about the alumni or strike up a conversation with them tomorrow over breakfast. We also have uh, underneath your chairs uh, the booklet, the brochure for our Linda L. Bean Conference Center, which we have our groundbreaking tomorrow. So I'd encourage you to take this home with you tonight and read it and get excited about for what, uh, what's to come at ISI. So with that, I will turn things over to our Director of Alumni Relations, Claire, who can give some final instructions for the evening. So this concludes our evening programming. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Yuval will be over to the side right here to sign books. If you would like to buy a copy, I highly encourage you to do so after that excellent talk. Um, for tomorrow morning, if you are driving to ISI, we will have valet services available. If you would like to ride the shuttles, they are leaving from Hotel DuPont and the Sheraton, where many of you are also staying. I will say we have a bus at, uh, shuttle buses at 8, 8.30, and 9, and the first panel begins at 9, which you will definitely want to be at. We have a spectacular panel on higher education with some all-stars, so please be on the 8 or 8.30 shuttles to ISI. Uh, breakfast will begin at 8.30 also at ISI, um, and now, in great ISI tradition, we encourage you to continue the conversation at the hotel bar. Thanks. Yeah.